What's happening, you bad motherfuckers? It's Wednesday, June 24th. Get your shit together. Greetings from Podcastville. Kick this motherfucking mule, Lee. Oh, shit. It all starts fucking today, all right? No more fucking excuses. This is the year of the fucking soldier. We're going in like fucking Marines. You understand me? Welcome to church, motherfucker. Oh, shit. Beautiful day to be alive, motherfuckers. It's Wednesday, the 24th. I have a guest, but first I want to talk to you. Happy Father's Day. Whenever with all this fucking stupidity, we didn't get a chance to talk about Father's Day. I hope all the dads had a good time and the kids and the whole fucking thing. Everything is great. We're back to normal. Uh, We didn't dodge a bullet. There was no bullet to dodge. There was nothing there. So... Thank you for having my back, you loyal motherfuckers. You know, uh, from day one, I've been talking about loyalty, and you guys proved it. You guys got the message how it works that good and bad, you got to stick together. If not, you have nothing. You have no reason to have friends. The people that do this type of shit, they're the people that watched friends and thought the world is fucking just, you know, so have them go fuck themselves. Besides that, I'm beautiful. I feel good. The flying fucking Jew. We did a couple edibles yesterday. I hope you enjoyed the live stream. You know what I'm saying? We're going to do a couple more of those. Wanted, dead or alive. I like that. I like that right off the bat. Representing. I'm smoking some fucking cherry gas from Urban Trees. And I'm just feeling good. I had a great Father's Day. I got to tell you a quick story. And then we'll bring in Russell. Uh, my, I had, I, Timmy Holloway is a dear friend of mine. Listener, family. He uh, sent me a Jimmy Page model. He sent me a Pistol Pete one and a Julia Serving one. This is, was this was his private stock, and he sent them to me. So I appreciate them very much. And an Ozzy Osbourne. And I had them all here in the office, and little by little, every time my daughter comes to the fucking office, she takes one. Like, all of a sudden, she's a fan of fucking Ozzy Osbourne. She liked it because he had a bat. Little did she know, that motherfucker had Wuhan. I threw that bat away, right? So... She took that one home, then she came in another time and took the fucking Julia Serving home, which I had at home anyway. She wanted to claim it, but I, I, I told, it stays at the fucking, on this table. She was all right with it. Then a few weeks ago, she comes in here, and she takes the fucking Jimmy Page one, because he has the double neck guitar and shit with the strap, and she went home and started listening to Led Zeppelin, believe it or not. I caught her watching the song, and it's the same, so now, because she's got... Um, uh, Nikki, whatever his name is, from Poison. Nikki Six? No, that's the guy um, from fucking whatever. I'm talking about the guy from Poison that comes in. Uh, anyway, it doesn't matter why we dropping names here. He left his drumsticks here and uh, as, as a souvenir, and she came in and took the drumsticks. So I told her John Bonham is the best fucking drummer, so she fucking, is, she takes, she watches Moby Dick, the video, live from the garden, and she plays the drums on her bed. It's fucking classic. So anyway, forget about that. Her mother asks her what she wants to give me for Father's Day. She goes, how about a statue, since I took Jimmy Page, how about a statue of fucking uh, Robert Plant? So they went online. They couldn't find Robert Plant. Then she went to the obvious. She went to Bruce Lee because she sits there and looks at my books all day. And there was no statues of Bruce Lee. So my wife goes, I don't know what to tell you. You know, pick one. And she started looking now. Yeah, my daughter watches Law and Order. Yeah, you know, shit like that. But nothing dirty. The other had to switch something. Oh, we were watching Ray. And she liked the piano playing. But as soon as he stuck the needle in his arm, I had to switch it. I don't, you know, she's too young for that shit right now. Yeah, I I showed her the exorcist when she was five. But that was a different <laughs> situation. You got to scare a bitch from time to time. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, yeah, there's a part in Ray where he bends over. And he grabs a little black boy's hand, his brother, when he was dead. And she fucking jumped. So right there, I'm like, I got to be careful. Let me switch this. So uh, I've never watched nothing bad with her. And if something comes on the TV, like I make her go inside her room and I watch John on HBO on Saturday and Sunday nights. What's his name? John Oliver. Right. Uh, you know, because he fucking go. He, he curses more than I do, that fucking Englishman. I love him. Uh, so... I try to just be clean with that, you know, whatever. I don't try to curse around her. I ask her if people say bad words around her in school, kids her age. She says sometimes, you know, same shit over and over again. 
But here's the clinker. So Sunday we get back from doing a podcast, her and I, we do a podcast about science. And she gives me a box. She goes, Dad, my fucking, your, not my fucking, your, your present came. Open it up. My wife looks at me. You want me to tell you what fucking statue she got me? Pardon me, I'm smoking a number here. You know what I'm saying? It's fucking Wednesday morning. You got to do what you got to do. It's hump day for some. It's slinging dick day for others. And you know who your others are. So she gave me a fucking statue of Tony Montana sitting there. There's no coke on his nose, thank God, because then I would have known. When she gave me the Scarface thing, I'm like, I looked at my wife. She goes, she picked it. She picked it herself. She says that she liked the way he was sitting down. So I don't know what to tell you guys. Maybe I'm doing the wrong job here. I don't know what the fuck. I've never mm-hmm. talked to her about blow. I've never. I I wouldn't even show her this movie till she's twenty. She could handle it. The fucking arm getting cut off and shit. She wouldn't go for that. So now, there's a fucking statue here. That's it. That's all I wanted to tell you. I wanted to tell you it's uh, good to be alive. It's a beautiful day to be alive. Russell Peters came in the other uh, day uh, out of a favor. He wanted just to get out of the house. And uh, we put a little podcast together for you. Here it is. I hope you enjoy it. What the fuck, Russell, is going on with the world? I don't know. Nobody knows what the fuck is going on with the world, Joey. Nobody has a clue. It is great to see you, brother. You too, brother. You know, fucking months. Let me tell you. Conclusion up there. Let me tell everybody. You were the only guy who checked on me consistently. Thank you. And. And and I'm not a good friend because I didn't check on you as much as you checked on me. I checked on everybody. I know. You know, man, I knew morale was going to be down. And you're an empath. Amongst the comics, I knew that I was doing, I know how I'm addicted to nighttime. Mm-hmm. I know what it was to stay in three nights, five nights, two weeks. Then they kept extending it. We were oh, in yeah. limbo and then more limbo. And guess what? It's the 23rd, the 22nd of June. And we're still in fucking limbo. The week in Brea this weekend is not going to happen. So if you were coming to Brea this weekend, my deepest apologies. The Brea Improv is going to open up after July 15th. Is that what they say? That's what they're saying. So, Uh, you know, Orange County got polluted again. Houston is polluted. Florida tripled. I'm going to Florida this week. Arizona tripled. So, you know, what part of Florida are you going to? Miami. Oh, that's canceled. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Broward County's fucked up. We'll see what happens. I hope it doesn't get canceled, to be honest with you. How you been? Uh, you know, I'm fucking surviving this shit. What the fuck have you been doing to pass the time? I used to do lives. I think everybody went through this whole phase of going live on Instagram for a while. And I think it just fizzled out. I, just stopped, it I stopped doing it. What were you doing at night? I would do it whenever I felt like it, really. And what would you talk about on there? I don't know. I would just talk to people, and then I would see, like, like friends of mine, like rappers or DJ friends of mine that would be in the chat, and I'd just add them in real quick, and we'd talk. So you could just add them in, and then they'd pop up? Yeah. You'd be like, hey, come on, let's talk. And then, you know, everybody would watch your conversation. It's like a podcast at that point. That's pretty fucking cool. Yeah. yeah. Pretty- I had Dom on with me one night. I had Little Rel one night. You don't de- you don't DJ DJ that much anymore. Yeah, I, I'll, sometimes I'll DJ. But the problem was that they were cracking down on DJs on Instagram. Oh, like, but it, but it was really hypocritical of them because they, they would let like, and I, I don't want I'm not shitting on these guys by any means because these are my friends. But they would let D Nice play for hours and anything he wanted, and they would let Quest Love play for hours and anything he wanted, and you know certain guys they would let go. Uh, and these guys are having like eight, ten thousand, twenty thousand. D Nice had with two hundred thousand people on one of his lives one time. Wow! And uh, and but then they started like uh, shutting guys down. And I, like I was DJing when I was having a great time. Everybody was fucking jamming. We're, and then I got a message: "You're you've just violated Instagram's uh, policy." I'm like, "What the fuck?" And then they, "Your live will not be saved." I'm like, "Fuck!" I went on a rant. I posted it on my Instagram. I don't know if you saw that. I don't know if you follow. You follow me, don't you? I don't know. I don't know. I have no idea who I follow. Cocksucker. Anymore. I don't know a shit about shit. You know, listen, let me tell you something about the other night. Let me tell you how bad it is. I haven't had a drink since the thing. Just because I'm scared it lowers your time. I don't drink anyway. Actually, I heard it's good for you. 
I don't know. There's no fucking <laughs> nothing. Nothing. You know what it's like? It's like a Trump supporter and a not Trump supporter. They can both uh, raise an argument for e- either of their stances. It's you the know. same with the COVID shit. When this fucking thing hit, I started eating edibles. I was home. I was lonely. I started eating edibles. You know, my wife was going to bed at eight o'clock with the baby, eight thirty. And I was eating edibles at night. And in the daytime, I was eating Xanax. Oh, in the day, little baby ones, mm-hmm. but like, dog, I I had them for years and I never touched them. And then the next thing you know, I'm eating them at twelve o'clock, eating them at three, and then I would stop because I didn't remember when Duff came on, and he said that he would eat them at night and you get addicted to them. Don't eat them at night to go oh, to sleep. Oh, because they go, yeah, they knock you and off. And then Rogan's guy, when he did the podcast on sleep, he said not to use things to help you go to sleep. Because you won't go to your full rim cycle. Oh, really? So I was like, what I'll do is, in the daytime, I'll take the baby Xanax, the 2.25s, not even the sticks. Mm-hmm. They're the circles. They don't do dick to you. It's just like a mental thing. Right. It's like a teddy bear. I go, I would eat three of those in the daytime, like prescribed. And then after five, I would start popping edibles. And dog, I was popping so many edibles, I was forgetting. Like, I would put two out. And go, and then my wife would call me, and I come back and go, "Where's the two? I wouldn't see those, and I pop two, and then I'd go, "Whoa, I didn't pop the two way, and I popped two more." And then one night I was talking to a friend on the phone, they're like, "Joe, you don't sound too good." That's when I started going, "Wait a second, I gotta calm it down with." It. And plus, my world was just getting fucking. When you eat edibles, and I you can't got skeletons edibles, in dude. the closet. And it's late at night, and you start thinking about stupid shit. Yeah. Stupid shit. Fifth grade shit. Yeah. You wore a stupid shirt. Oh, yeah. The first time kids called you names because you wore fucking colored socks to gym. You know, like shit like that. Yeah, like, yeah. not even nothing to do with the fucking what was going on in your life. Nothing to do with COVID. Nothing to do about comedy. Nothing about it's bring, career. It's bringing back shit that traumatized you. Just traumatized you. you. Thinking yeah. about, I remember in the first grade, I got in trouble for throwing the statues out the window on the third floor of PS-166. And they fucking told me they would call my mother. And I remembered that shit. I remembered everything that had nothing. And that night came in, I remember I told you guys in the podcast that this type of shit makes you think of shit that you haven't thought of in years. Yeah, it does dig deep in you. It digs deep in you. So I said, fuck it. April came along. I couldn't work out. I would hit the bag and I couldn't breathe. I couldn't catch my breath. Mm-hmm. I would feel the pressure on my neck. I thought I was going to have a stroke. Where are you getting pressure on your neck from? I don't know. Because the stress I had in me, the, mm. you know, when is the comedy store going to reopen? What are we going to do with our comedy? Fucking people going to starve. I had all these horrible things going on in my mind. And then I just, something happened. Like, I got better. I said, I'm going to stop with the edibles. Let's stop with the edibles. And that really kicked it down 50%. That was... 50% of my anxiety. Then I got a bicycle. Mm. The guy I, next door gave me you, a bicycle. I got one of those bikes with the motor assist on. It's fucking incredible. All that shit's tremendous. Mm. That's perfect when you hit a hill. Yeah. <clears throat> but I got a bike, and I started riding the bike early, 7 in the morning. Oh, yeah, you know, you were calling me and telling me you was up at 7. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? Yeah, yeah, seven? get up, do a couple notes, post messages, and fucking brush your teeth. I took a shower before I went to bed. Brush my teeth, comb my hair. I wouldn't even eat breakfast. No breakfast. Maybe a little, uh, whatever, a coffee. Yeah. Cuban coffee, two espressos. Get on the bike and go the for Cuban a Cuban coffee. While. I know how you got on a bike after a Cuban and coffee. Go, I would shit myself. Oh, tremendous. Those <laughs> pedals move. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> you do three shots of Cuban coffee oh, at I, 7 I, in the morning. Man. You watch those pedals move, baby. <laughs> you know, but I remember the, like the third day I went out, guys. I went out with a mask. And I remember going, today I'm doing 20 minutes. And I remember at the end of the 20 minutes, like I looked at my thing and I had 19 to go. I was completely drenched in sweat. It was one of those days and it was 90 already at 8 in the mm-hmm. morning. My snots were dripping under the mask. Oh, yeah, it's the worst. When I took the mask off, I'm like, I'm not wearing this mask no more when I ride a bike. Yeah. Not at 7 in the morning. There's nobody yeah. out. Yeah. There's nobody out. What am I going to wear? And then today, or last week, Newsom said, you don't have to wear a mask if you exercise. And that's why I was like, oh, thank God. Whoo, thank yeah. God. That, bro, I would look in the mirror to piss. I had fucking not even frozen snot. It was like snot that had been freeze dried. 
Oh, that's yeah, that's into my lip. I could taste something salty, but I didn't know what it was. I'm yeah. like, maybe I cut my lip. It was the snot just dripping, like just. That was the first, the third day I was on a bike. That's how out of shape, like uh, stressful. With and then you got the mask, which is like fucking killing yourself to live with. You know, yeah, you can't yeah you're work fucking out. sucking in CO two. The too. mask was wet. I stop. I start yawning like crazy when I put that goddamn mask on. Yeah, that's why I don't like it. That's why I don't fucking like him. Once I started adding that, I got to be honest with you, Russell. Things started slowing down. But let me tell you what I, I then I went online. I. Sag, somebody sent me something. How to cope with stress during these hard times. And I went and I started reading it. And it said there's different forms of shit you're going to see. I'm going to tell you a story. It said that short-term memory. Yeah. Now, I could fucking tell you what I did in 1982, the conversation, what time I had it. I swear to you guys, the other night. Me, my wife, and my daughter were playing Battleship. And we played till nine. My daughter went to bed. Me and my wife kept yakking. At one point, I go, let me go outside. Let me go take a shower. I look at the sunburn. I got third degree sunburn Damn. in Ventura. So she's peeling skin off me. Oof. So I took a shower, came out. I put my shorts on. She comes in. She goes, don't put your shirt on so I can rub some aloe on mm -hmm. she rubbed aloe on me we talked for a little while i went outside to the living room and she said to me do you mind if i have a beer tonight i had a rub i go you better get two she goes i'm gonna go sit outside for a couple minutes i went into my office i started going you know writing notes or whatever the fuck i do at night it must have been 10 45 i swear to you both do you know at one more point i go well i gotta go take a shower <laughs> and something when I went to get up I looked down and I looked at my shorts and that's how I remembered I took a shower my short term Mary's been taking a shit I was telling you a story before we went on the air and I couldn't remember the fucking remember I had to ask you I yeah. said what was, I, what was I saying and I was in the middle of telling the fucking story horrible Lee tell that fucking tell your pet to stay at home in the fucking <laughs> in the car look at him I can't that's help a, it that's a fucking know. That's a Jewish bug right there. That motherfucker, he's hard to kill. He's like Steve Seagal in fucking 97. But uh, that's what it affects me in my short. Like, I could not remember. Yeah, If same. I took a shower an hour and a half or... I can't remember if I took my fucking pills in the morning. Oh, I do that shit all the time. Like, did I take it? I don't know. Did the bottle move? I can't tell if the bottle moved. Thank moving. God my wife has Monday through Friday through Sunday. No, I have those, but then I have separate ones that I take in the morning. That, like, first thing. And then I got the pill boxes for downstairs. You know what I mean? I got a process. I got to open up the protein cabinet. I got to spray steroid in both nostrils. Mm -hmm. And then I got to take You got to do that sideways shit, right? Yeah. That for, and then I do uh, a pill for your thyroid. You had to do one of those? Then I eat breakfast. Then I take my blood pressure medication and my multivitamin with the shit in my stomach. Yep. So, but very fine. very similar routines we have. Well, sadly. I have the same process. I have to put the dish down and go move right to the pills. If for some reason I put the dish down and I gotta take a shit, I forget to take those fucking pills. Mm -hmm. Then all day long I'm banging my head on the wall. And I take those pills. Thank God my wife puts them in Monday to Wednesday, so I'll go back look and go. I didn't take them. Fuck. If not, I'm fucking retarded. Mm -hmm. For me, it's like stuff that I usually like to do. Just, I'm not, I don't feel like I'm depressed, but like everyone's watching TV. I love TV. I haven't watched. I, I watch. I'm watching sitcoms that I've watched eight thousand times because I can't. Fo I don't want to sit down and focus on a TV show. I don't know. I just, I, focus was gone. Yeah, I, I can't watch shit. About I couldn't watch shit. I watched something one night. And the next morning, I didn't remember what I watched. Like I'm like, so I just started watching The Sopranos, Sons of Anarchy, and Narcos from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And every time I put them on, they're sleeping pills. They're sleeping pill. As soon as I put them on, I wake up 2.30 in the morning, I'm on the fucking couch. Honestly, to get me to sleep, I put porn on. This I don't know what it is about the sound of it. It knocks me out. You don't jerk off? No, I think I'm going to, and then I watch it, and I'm like, I go, well, I guess I don't need to jerk now, off. Do you watch porn when there's, when your wives are in the house? No, uh, son's, my son's mother. Um, <laughs> never, we were never married, just for the record. Um no, I mean we we weren't even sleeping in the same fucking room anymore. 
That's always the thrill, isn't it? Yeah. I was up, she was down. Whatever. You don't go to bed till five in the morning anyway. No, nah, I go to bed. I try to go to bed early. I try to be in bed by like eleven thirty, twelve o'clock. Really? Yeah. Oh, I thought you were a night stalker. I, you- I used to be when I was a little younger. I can't do that shit no more. I love no, it, I feel it the next day. That's I love why. to. I love to stay up till three. I love to know that I could stay up till four with no penalties and go on a writing. Story. I could do that in New York. Yes, because you're going to be up anyway. I did it in New York. When I New York started. is no problem. I stay up till four, and I know. Yeah. I, the thing is, in New York, you know you can get breakfast at fucking four in the afternoon, so you're okay. I remember one night talking to Lee and breaking his balls. It had to be one in the morning in New York, and I'm torching him about. He had like a salami sandwich. And next time, was I in New York or were you in New York? I was in New oh, York, okay. and you were here. And I'm, I call Lee, and I'm like, "What's going on?" He's like, "I'm nothing." I, I'm just eating something. I go, Lee, you're going to fucking die. You keep eating that shit. And I'm not, I, I don't hang up with him two minutes. I go downstairs. I smoke a joint. I get a cup of coffee. I'm one of those motherfuckers that drinks coffee, too. At, at night? Oh, yeah. Oh, I I'll drink it. Not anymore. Not anymore. <laughs> but, 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 but for me to go to the store, I need four shots of Cuban. How many a day do you drink? I drink American coffee when I wake up just mm-hmm. to get the party started. <laughs> okay. I drink regular, nice, dark roast. I like a dark strong. roast, too. Yeah. yeah. I like a black. I drink it black. Black. Yeah. Black coffee to get the party started. That's the first party. I pop a little nicotine gum, and that just gets the blood muscle moving. Mm-hmm. Then I get up, I do a couple, like, Puerto Rican yoga stretches, like I stretch my spine, mm-hmm. I touch my toenails. Then I hit two bong hits. After I'm about 42 minutes... <laughs> I do about two bong hits when the music is starting to sound good. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and once I inhale those two bong hits, I go into the kitchen. I drink like 10 ounces of cold, cold, cold water. Mm-hmm. And then I blast a four-man espresso before I wash my pussy. Ugh. Before I take a shower, I blast a four-man espresso. And then I drink another bottle of water. And then after that, let's say I eat or I'll eat oatmeal and then do the four cup espresso. And then you're just waiting for your guts to come out. It's just a matter of time. Oh, yeah. No, I, 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 so my, my body com- knows it's a science. You go on the computer, you type a couple things, all of a sudden you just you rip that fart. It smells like the guts of your <laughs> fucking enemy. It just smells like <laughs> your fucking ass. And you're like, well, I'm ready. I go in the back bathroom. I got a door to the outside mm-hmm. so that I don't kill any of the bathrooms in the house. Oh, yeah. And that's that first one. That's pure fire. By this time, it's 745. I'm already throwing heat. It's a log. My <laughs> asshole's on fire. You know, I mean, it's one of those things where you sit up, you walk. When you walk back, you walk with a limp. Yeah. <laughs> one of those shits. You know what I'm saying? Where it took like, something out of your leg. Yeah, it takes. I mean, I, I'm serious. Oatmeal, a nice cup and a half of oatmeal. And then the fourth shot of espresso. What do you have in the oatmeal? You have sugar or honey or cinnamon? Cinnamon, cinnamon, and coconut milk. Mm. Can't mm. fuck with that. Mm. I I like my milk regular. Milk. I like my. I'll do regular too. But if I don't, if I'm, if if my wife, if I know like my wife's gonna get pizza, I won't put dairy. Oh, okay. I'll put coconut because you'll have the dairy later. I have the dairy later, and then that'll make me go fucking crazy. So. What's I'm going on with the rap game? You no. still producing the show? What's going on? No, nah, we we did four seasons. You know, we won an Emmy, we won a Peabody, and then uh, they didn't want a uh, Netflix didn't want a fifth. I'm like, all right, cool. But I got another doc that I'm working on. Okay, it's almost done. It's and you really always, you know, I was thinking of, the one day I called you mm-hmm. was because the edible. I called you late one night. Right. I called you late to tell you a story. Yeah, it was about ten thirty. You was uh, calling. You me. didn't answer. I called you late one night because I was in the middle of an edible run. Mm-hmm. I'm making an outline for the book, and I remember the history of crack cocaine. Mm-hmm. I'm thinking about how I, I grew up on 148th Street in the Bronx. No, no oh no, you were like Washington. I just no, you're like I was on 88th Street. My mother lived on 88th Street. I went to public school on 89th Street. On oh, so you were side. just uptown? Up, up, yeah, up, I was up, an uptown guy. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. my godmother, my Santeria godmother, mm-hmm. 
lived on on 48th Street. That was so she's Harlem. Harlem almost. She is it's, Harlem. It's Harlem. She is Harlem, it's yeah. Harlem. And it was a great neighborhood. I learned a lot there. A couple of blocks up, you can cross over to the to the uh, to uh, into the fucking Yankee Stadium over there. Right there, one sixty nine. Yeah, you cross yeah. right over. So it was uh, that whole block. Not when I lived with, my, not when I was with my godmother. As I got older, ten years later, I would go visit my godmother. I would surprise. I'd bring her flowers. She talked to me, and then on the way out, I just crossed the street and cop Buddha Thai weed. They would sell Buddha Thai, Buddha Thai, Buddha Thai, Buddha Thai. This is 82, 81, 82. Oh, yeah, that's where they're smoking Thai stick and Buddha. Thai stick and Buddha. Yeah. And they either sold you Buddha, Thai stick, or they sold you Sensamilla. It was the beginning of Narcos. The... Yeah. Uh, all and that all... shit of Narcos, Mexico, when they started sending Sensamilla, that was 1980 fucking That was two. a Jamaican one. Well, the Jamaican one was uh, lamb's bread. Right. That was what they sold in the city. That was big. That fucked you up. I remember that. Why is it called lamb's bread? Because it's some bad shit. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> that, the people don't even know about lamb's bread today. Very, very, very few people know the power of lamb's bread. You know, they used to call all that weed chocolate Thai, Buddha Thai. Yeah. But basically, it was lamb's bread, and it was Jamaican weed, and it Fucked you up. And then in like I mean, around 80, 45, they started smoking Willow Blunts. Well, before that was when the sense of me started coming around. And then I had a school teacher, Mr. Pullman. He used to fucking get Maui Wawi shipped to him. I remember Maui Wawi. And he would sell it to you at school with a stick. With Hilarious. A $35 for three joints. Jesus. That was more than you ever paid in your life. How much was the regular joint? Like a dollar a joint. Oh, shit, okay. So you could buy a half ounce of, of, of dirt weed and get, you know, pay 25 bucks and get 32 joints so I can make $7. Like that was your thinking when you were a sophomore in high school. Mm -hmm. Seven joints is 20 bucks today. So do you see what I'm saying? Like I made 20 on 25 investment. So I would buy a, a quarter pound for 100 bucks and sell it for 200 right off the bat. I was, I was doing that shit in the late 80s. When I was a sophomore, I hung out with a guy that that's what he sold. He would front it to me. He would drive me. He would drive me, give it to me. I'd go upstairs and I'd keep 100, give him 100. That's how quick I made $100 in those days. That was the eighth grade freshman year. But going back to my godmother, when I went back and this is all in 82, 83. Mm -hmm. I went to Colorado in 83. Came back and I never really went to see my godmother. I was on the shit list. Mm -hmm. And then finally in 85, I, had, I came up with enough guts to go see my godmother. And I went down the stairs and I go, perfect, I'm going to get some weed to go back to Colorado. But as I was waiting at the light to cross, I seen all these motherfuckers putting cardboard down, fucking like making believe fighting. Mm -hmm. And then they would start spitting on their backs and shit. Oh, and that was more or less. The that was 82 then. Dancing. Yeah. 81, that was, 82. That was... Like, it was everywhere now. Like, I had been in such a cocaine closet, I missed the beginning of all that shit. And i never forget going up to a guy and going, where's the reefer? Who's out? And the guy's like, there ain't no reef on this block no more. This is straight up Crackville. Yeah. And I'm like, oh. oh. Like, you know, Crackville was 181st and up. Oh, yeah, it hit the Bronx hard. It hit the Bronx hard, Crackville. <clears throat> I had friends, my friends in the Bronx told me crazy stories. One of them was like, yo, he, he said he was on. I said, when did you, get, when, how long were you on crack for? He goes, right up until around 97. I go, are you fucking kidding me, dude? 97? He goes, yeah, I had it bad. I go, he goes, you ever see those movies and then those abandoned buildings with the fucking crackheads everywhere and fucking just strung out? He goes, I was in those buildings. Fucking raw dogging these crackhead chicks. I'm surprised I don't have AIDS. Oh my like, god damn. Wow. Crack was fucked up, man. I could lie, lie to you and tell you I went to a crack then. I never went to a crack then. I Did you my... try crack? Yes, here. Oh, really? Can you believe that? Here. How was it? 2002. Wow. 2000... I couldn't find it in 2002. 2002. It was a throwback crack. <laughs> 2002, 2003, they sold it on Orange and Salma. 
right, in Hollywood, right down the block from Man's Chinese Theater. Wow! The, if you cross the street, yeah, yeah, I know Man's where it is. The building theater, right there, and you walk down, and then you hit Hollywood High School parking lot yeah, yeah. right down the corner. There'd be two guys there every night standing there. So I'd be fucked up from the coke and drinking at the comedy store. So I'd drive on Selma all the way home, cross Highland, cross La Brea. And then by the time I got to Orange, you know, every night they would stare at me and I would stare at them. And one night I go, what's all this staring about? So I pulled <laughs> up, I go, what's cracking? And he goes, crack. You know, he didn't say crack. He goes, I got rock. Yeah. So I said, let me get a 20. And he fucking went in his mouth and took a bag out and gave it to me. I'm like, all right, see you later. That's well, normal? Yeah, with a baggie with a twist on oh, it and shit. Yeah. They hide it in their mouth and shit so they can swallow it, right? So he gives me the bag and fucking I go home and my girlfriend at the time, who was now my wife, was sleeping. And I took it home and I fucking uh, crushed it up. This is how stupid Uncle Joey is. I crushed that fucking rock up to death. It was a mountain of coke and I fucking snorted. And I sat there for 20 minutes and... My throat got a little numb, but nothing happened. The party didn't start. I didn't jerk off, nothing. Yeah. And the next day, I told a dear friend of mine that was a fucking animal what I did. And he goes, they sold you crack, stupid. You got a fucking I, you got a free goes, base, you fucking that retarded? shit. He goes, you got to smoke that. I go, you smoke crack? Like, I didn't know. He goes, you got to get a pipe and all. And I go, all right. So the next night, I went over there again. I bought <laughs> crack, and I put in a Coke can. I went home, cracked up a Coke can, put holes in it. And I started smoking crack. And I smoked crack for about six weeks. My wife would wake up in the middle of the night and go, Joey, what's that smell? And I would go, it's a new reefer I got. Go back to bed. <laughs> I would buy four rocks, six rocks. How was it? It was disgusting. It was part of my disgusting days. No, no, no. But how did, like, what was the buzz like on it? It was like uh, a cousin to cocaine. At that time, Russell... I think it was like 2001. Mm -hmm. It was all the same. It didn't matter what night it was, you know. It just, it's all one big blur now, but I, it, I, I was, I smoked crack for about six or seven weeks. And then I had a two week run in El Paso. He mm -hmm. used to hire me for like two week runs. So he would hire me for like one week to open up for Russell as a feature. And he liked me so much. He'd go, why don't you do me a favor? Open for me? Like, yeah, yeah, oh, no, like, you know, for a guy like you, for, uh, <laughs> you know, when I was a feature, when I was a feature headliner, you know, I could headline, yeah. but I was really a strong feature, he right. would say, open up for Russell, stay, because he had a condo, they go stay, and then uh, do a show Wednesday by yourself, and then Russell's cousin's coming in Friday and Saturday, and then you do Sunday, you headline Sunday, and I would do that. So when I went down there, nobody's got cracking up ass. So they got the real thing. Mm -hmm. That they walk it over. Yeah, for you. They just walk it over. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. You could call Mexico. Where you at? I'd be there in 10 minutes. And all of a sudden, a fucking, a fucking uh, a sewer plate pops up. The Mexican comes out with a little mud on his head. Like Felipe on uh, on Three's Company. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yes. yes. It's crazy. There's <laughs> cocaine everywhere. So when I went down there, I looked for crack. I couldn't find it. So I went back to Snort Coke. That's how I got rid of crack. <laughs> I remember I remember it was, must have been around 1994, and I was driving in Toronto. I thought I was fly because I had this fucking Saturn. Oh, actually, it must have been 95 because I, I had rims on it already. I had a Saturn, but it had no, I didn't have no AC. I didn't have power windows, nothing. So I had to roll down all the windows, and I had a sound system that I put in the trunk. And I'm driving through this crackhead part of town. And uh, I'm at a red light. Music's playing. There's a girl standing at the corner. She's cute. She looks at me and smiles. I go, what's up? I go, where are you going? She goes, I'm going that way. I go, get in. So she gets in. She goes, thanks. Uh, can you take me? I'm going to my uncle's. I go, ah, cool, no problem. Because do you mind if I smoke? I go, ah, now go ahead. She pulls out a fucking asthma inhaler. <laughs> puts a rock on it and starts lighting up in my car. I go, yo, what the fuck are you smoking? She goes, I know, it's a bad habit. I go, no, 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 uh, cigarettes are a bad habit. You're fucking smoking crack in my car. 
Uh, I go, why don't you smoke some weed? Do you got some? I go, actually, yeah, because I was selling weed at the time. I go, actually, yes, I do. So I, she goes, oh, good. So I went to her uncle's with her, some shady ass <laughs> building. I walk in, her uncle's there. <laughs> you go, you got weed? Yeah, you got weed. Yeah. So I sold him some weed, and I just got the fuck out because I was like, I don't know if I'm gonna get shot, stabbed, whatever's gonna happen in here. You know, when you tell stories like this, it's like when I tell stories like this, and it's crazy because people can't fathom that no they don't realize how fucking weird our lives are how weird and crazy position you know when you come to hollywood as a woman as a young man you see things you know these women that complain this that you know they see something and you just get sucked in by it and i can tell you something there was nine parts in my life I can name nine situations in my life where at one point I said to myself, I really don't belong here. Like, oh, I, just, I say that every I fucking am. day. I say that shit. You know, this isn't who I am at all. I didn't come here to see a guy get beat or a guy get hit in the head with a pipe. <laughs> or, you know, I see my stepfather shoot a guy at eight. I didn't, I wasn't a participant to all that stuff. One story that I told on Ari's that I didn't tell the full creepiness of was when I sold that guy the stolen thing and he gave me 60 bucks and he gave me some heroin. That was like a horrible night for me. I made it funny. But if I really sat down with people and described what happened to me that night and how there was an old lady, the, the whole time we did we did coke first and then he's like, you, you should try this heroin. I'm 16. No, oh, wow. I'm 16. He's 29. Who the fuck knew? I don't know he's that much older than me. Yeah, he looked like fucking Tony Iommi from Black Sabbath. But he was cool with all my friends. Like, he was one of the older guys that we were cool with. And when I came in, he, he goes, you want a blow job? I got a girl in the bathroom that likes to suck dick while you take a shit. Oh, a blow job. I'm sick of that right there. Just hearing that. That's traumatic for some people. I'm like, nah, I'm good. Like, nah, I'm good, bro. I wasn't into disgust yet. I was still a Catholic. My mother had died. Right. And I hadn't lost my faith yet. And I was like, ah, nah, I'm okay. I just want to pick up the 60 bucks. That, uh, you know, and he's like, well, I'll sit down. Let's do a couple lines. And he came out and did, we did the heroin. When I was on the heroin, he asked me 10 times, like, you sure you don't want that chick to suck your dick? Like, it was so disturbing looking at it now. I didn't make it disturbing. It was a joke. You know, it was a fucking joke. Now I look at it as kind of funny. But I didn't belong there that night. You know? I didn't belong there. Yeah. You know, so. Nobody really belongs It's kind of weird when you have stories like that, that a chick got in your car. I was in Montana. I love to say Missoula. But it could have been Billings. No, it wasn't Billings. It was either Missoula or one of those. I get to the fucking club. Russell, I'm a, a junkie. But I'm in Montana. What are my chances of copying? Mm -hmm. Unless the way uh, the kitchen guy is Mexican. Like I was in South Dakota one time. I made eye contact with the bus boy. And next thing you know, I was snorting coke. You know, he was the only Puerto Rican in town. He was in the Bronx. Hilarious. He was in the service. And on the weekends, he washed dishes at this restaurant I did comedy at. Which it was a triple run. You know what I'm saying? So you could cop in North Dakota, Green Dakota, South Dakota something. You yeah. could cop anywhere. But I'm in Montana. I'm not looking to cop. I'm not looking. I'm not even thinking you're about probably, copping. In your head, you're probably looking forward to a weekend of being clean. Yeah, I was like, I'm doing Montana, Portland. Maybe I'll cop in, I think Saturday. I was like, I know I could cop at that place. Yeah. So here I am in Montana. Hey, how you doing? Joe Diaz, the feature act. I'm the MC. Nice to meet you. The MC goes up on stage. The owner comes over. He goes, this is my daughter. Girl was fucking beautiful, tall, and, uh, you know, uh, tell her what you want if you're hungry. He walks away. I'm thinking this girl goes to, like, Yale. She had that Yale look mm -hmm. to her. And the girl says, how you doing? How was your drive-in? Is the hotel fine for you? You know how people ask those basic yeah, yeah, questions. Yeah, the, the generics. And right on, she looks me in the eye and she goes, if there's anything you need. I mean anything. Ask me. I'm like, okay. Let's start off with the basics. Because before I buy the fucking lobster Cantonese, I gotta try the pork fried rice. 
I go, you got reefer? And she goes, yeah, what do you want? I'm like, I don't know, give me $60 worth of reefer. Yeah, she goes, I'll be right back. Left, came back, boom, reefer. <clears throat> and she goes, anything else? I go, I don't know. Let me go on stage and I'll think about it. I went on stage, I got on stage. Uh, they paid me. I pulled her aside, I go, can you get some powder? She goes, it's not here. I got to go for a ride if you want to come. I go, well, I got the V track with me. I don't really want them to know what's going on. So she goes, I just bring it to your hotel room. Like, okay. You know, half hour, I get a call in the hotel room. I didn't have a cell phone then. And she's like, I'm on my way. I'll be there. She showed up. Very nice. Nothing sexual, nothing. She sat down. She goes, do you mind if I do a taste? I go, no, go ahead. And I had stopped to get like beers. I got a beer for her and when I turned around, bro, she was taking out a rig. And I'm like, what are you doing? And she goes, I don't snort that, that's for pussies. She goes, I shoot it. Oh, 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 wow. Jesus Christ. So who would expect to see somebody mm. shoot coke, a woman who's beautiful, by the way. This was not some girl with fucked up teeth and a broken car. This girl had a dad who owned a bar. She went to college. She didn't snort coke. She was shooting. If you thought I expected to see that in, in whatever Montana, no. No, not at all. You know Rico? I know a few Rico's. With the spider on his face from Seattle, big black guy. He's a Muslim. I know. <laughs> I went to one of those towns with him one time on the dock because there was three bookers that had rooms in Missoula mm -hmm. or like one of those towns, like one of those college towns. I've never been to Montana. Tribble. Billings is a Billings is a great comedy town. Tribble, Donna Richards, and somebody else, another lady from Seattle, booked a room. What are we talking about? Uh, what are you talking about Montana? Montana. Rico. And we took yeah. I went with Rico. Now, this is an all-white town. This was before the chick. This was like two years, maybe five years before I went with, and the chick hooked me up with the blow. This is, I'm still living in Seattle. It's March of 96, 97, 96. Rico's six foot six, 350 pounds, and black is beautiful. And on his face, he has a spider. He let his beard grow, but he pays the guy to shape it into a spider. Oh and he's good God. friends with Doug Stanhope. Rico's cool as shit. He was there when the cops were looking for me and I had to jump in the garbage can. And then I came out and he's like, where are you? And the cops saw him and I'm like, Rico, you're six foot fucking six, 300 pounds, and you're waving your eyes. And there's cops everywhere. I couldn't run to you. I told you to pick me up in front of the fucking hurricane lounge, not 100 yards away from the fucking hurricane lounge. So right away, the cops come. I got to jump in a garbage can. They couldn't figure out I was in the fucking garbage can, the cops. I, there was an old Rambo move I pulled. <laughs> so, <laughs> what the fuck were you talking about? So we do the gig, me and Rico. Biggest, blackest guy you've seen. Is he a comic? Or? Yeah, he's a comic in Seattle now. He's good friends with Doug Stanhope. Okay. It was him, Doug, Mitch Hedberg. Every time we did Seattle, it was a party with those guys. We used to laugh and oh, Mitch, off. for sure. Doug Stanhope used to go, hold on, ladies and gentlemen, real quick. My friend, I want to give him a minute guest spot. He would give us one-minute guest spots in those days. Me, Rico. Doug? Was, yeah. Oh, Jesus. You have one minute. Go. And he would sit there. <laughs> and you would have one minute to do material. And shit. This is when Doug was like just, when, before he walked him, yeah. Before he unleashed the last hell of fury he'd have, when they were all beat up and shit. This is Doug Stanhope, 96, 97. Mm. Nobody had seen that type of shit yet. He was out of his fucking mind. When I mean out of his mind, Russell, I mean when you watch this show, you were like, I don't believe this is happening type shit. He's tamed down. Anybody watch his new special? I haven't. I don't watch anybody's special. You have to. He's his early. He's a fucking nut. I remember his act from back in the day. It's yeah, great. he was out there. Oh, yeah. And he was like the, the original fucking uh, uh, alternative. So we fucking went to a diner the next morning. We ordered breakfast. The food comes. It's filled with white people. 
Rico stands up. He's Muslim. He gets on the floor. He throws like a fucking thing down. And he starts praying on the floor in a restaurant in Montana. Me? I may believe like I didn't know. You should have seen me. At that moment in my life, no Black Lives Matter. I was with them. I was like, dog, they're going to shoot him, and I can't do this. I just kept eating my eggs like I didn't know him and shit. When he sat back at the table, I'm like, who are you? I think I was like fucking, it was nuts. Six foot six, 300 pound Muslim in Montana. This is like way before 9-11 and shit. Or they would have fucking killed him. Oh. I, I remember my friend's father was on crack back in the day, in the mid '80s, and we'd go to his house, and his dad would he'd get lockjaw from it. You're like William, <laughs> go to the fucking store and get some chicken. I'm like, hey, what's wrong with your dad? And he's on right. He's on rock right now. And I'm like, oh okay. We, we didn't even think about it. It wasn't like oh my god. It wasn't like an after school special. It was just like oh okay. And then we just go to the store and steal some chicken. And then uh, one night I slept over. I slept on the couch in, the, in their place. Middle of the night, I got to go to the bathroom. I opened the bathroom door. His dad's in there with a dude and another chick, and they're fucking shooting up. And I woke up. Oh, sorry. I just closed the door. I went back to bed. You know, the world of drugs is a dirty fucking business, man. It's yeah. It's a dirty business. It's funny because I saw his dad like uh, a couple of years ago. And I was like, hey, you clean now? He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I go, and you were fucked up in the 80s, man. <laughs> you were doing rock. I walked in on you doing heroin. You did? I go, yeah, yeah. Well, right in there, it was you. I, uh, I forgot his name, and then there's some chick in there, too. He goes, oh, yeah, it was a good time back then. It was good times back then. I will tell you one thing. I do get pissed off when I watch Narcos sometimes. I can't lie to you. Not the Mexican ones. The other ones, the Colombian ones, because the government knew. Oh, yeah. We got killed. We got killed. You know this COVID epidemic? That was a cocaine epidemic. And people were losing themselves right in front of me. Losing themselves in front of me. I, I remember going to school with a girl that was a sweetheart. Funny, drank, partied. But had her head on right, was going to a good college. Her mother was a, a big time in the post office, put away money for her to go to some big time college. And right before fucking going to college time, I was a dropout. I would watch, me and this girl were friends. We were friends, we were dear friends. I knew her mother, I knew her brother, I knew her father. And she would just drop out on me. Like you talked to her lately? No, nah, I haven't talked to her in two days. Then one of her girlfriends would call me. You see her lately? Ah, that's weird. She was supposed to call me to go do it. And then she'd come back like nothing happened. Mm -hmm. This went on for months. Months it went on. And then finally, like, college is starting. And I'm like, she's up in college. So the deal was she would go to school during the week and then come back on the weekends. And then we would see her Friday night, ready to go. She would be right there with us, snorting, drinking. Who is she? She ain't around. Again, disappeared. And then we, I started getting calls from my mother. I got a call from the college. She hasn't been in school in a month. Do you know where she is? You have to know. It's like she was accusing me. You know. And I'm like, I don't fucking know. Her girlfriends are calling me. You know where she I don't fucking know. She was around while she was running with a married dude. Oh, wow. That was a gangster snorting tons of blow. Going to Atlantic City, getting fucking the top room in there. And you know what? One night they were driving home. They kept it a secret. And they were driving fucking home from Atlantic City. And they were driving on Tunley Avenue where Chance is. And they fucking hit a couple, a 70-year-old couple on the way to church and killed them. When she went to county jail, she found out she was pregnant. No, oh, from that guy? From the guy, from the married dude. He, he was went, driving though, right? He was driving. But they had been on a three-day bender. So he got charged with vehicular manslaughter. He went away. She, in the shame of the family, picked up and they moved away. She just popped up on Facebook a couple of years ago. Did she have the kid? Oh, yeah. The kid is gorgeous. The kid is gorgeous. But it's just amazing how... I don't even know what made me tell you that story. Just 
that's how fast your life could change, you know. Well, you were saying it, you were, it upset you with narcos because the government did it to us. The government did it to us, and they knew it, like by 85. And I saw people break. I have a lot of people who died, and I saw people who've had fucked up lives for the last 30 years. I'm not blaming it. I'm not saying that I wasn't going to do coke. But now to find out that our own government was shipping it in, and the CIA and Barry Seal and all that shit, it kind of fucking upsets you a little bit that it was a pandemic, bro. It was, I, I knew you, I grew up with you, Lee. You've never done anything wrong. All of a sudden I go to a club in the city and there's Lee sweating yeah. with coke. And he's like, I, you didn't know I, I became a coke dealer. What? <laughs> What do you mean you became a coke dealer? You, you were working at the laundry when I knew you for four years. You were an A student. I changed powders. Like that's <laughs> that's how quick people had become dealers. Father teams, mother father son teams, gave up their investments and went to Miami and they would try to become pirates. They would call. There was a name for them. In fact, Miami Vice did an episode about that, like the third episode about kids from New York that thought they were going to be kingpins. And they would go to Miami with 60 G's and fucking go up to somebody on the street. You know where to get two kilos? I have $60,000. Where you at? Uh, Room 312, the Hilton. Next thing you know, six fucking Salvadoranians are coming in there with knives taking your money. They were doing that shit to everybody. You, could, you couldn't just go to Miami and buy a kilo. They would take your money. Right in the hotel room. They would shoot you right in the hotel room and take your money. Yeah, Miami in the 80s was crazy. It was crazy. I have friends that went down there, got set up. I can have one of them call in, Danny B. Danny B got set up down there. Friend of ours. Called them, go down there, bring the money. They went down there. Six people popped out of a closet, handcuffed them, and took their money. That was a big business in the beginning, unless you knew somebody for sure. Like, I got a guy you can see down there. His name is Russell. Go to Miami. But you were just going down and they give up your fucking money. But father son teams, people gave up their like their bank accounts to make an investment in cocaine. It was thirty thousand a key, a hundred a gram all day long. Everybody knew it was a hundred. There was no discounts. And when you did the math on paper on the calculator, it was the profit was amazing. And you were not gonna get stuck with it. You were not gonna get stuck with it. But I talked to a friend of mine two days ago. I've been seeing his post on Facebook. Not too good. So I picked up the phone. I know him from the sixth grade. Mm -hmm. And he blatantly said it to me. He goes, the 80s didn't do me no favors. He goes, I became a drug addict. I lost my kid. Now I'm fucking this age. I got this much left in my 401k. And, you know, the 80s fucked up some people. I was one of them. It was fast. I still remember in 82... Selling half grams, thinking I was the sixth family, mm -hmm. me and three of my friends thinking we were the sixth family. And this kid came up to me one day. In fact, a friend of mine is listening to this right now. His name is Timmy Holloway. He's my dog, and he'll vouch for that story that we had a dude named Steve. There was a place. There was a crew called the Six Family, wasn't it? Nah, yeah, yeah, it probably was. But there was no a six or the five there. families of something like yeah. that. It was all Hispanics. No, no, this is just a joke. That, no, there really was, though. No, there probably was. In, in New York. There probably was, yeah. but there's a joke. It's just a joke. That we thought we were young. We were the mafia. Yeah. And we were selling and all of a sudden, this kid comes to me one day. He goes, hey, man, this is Pimp who wants to meet you. I'm fucking 18 years old. And a pimp wants to meet me? Yeah, I, I gave him some of your coke, and it's the best shit around. He wants to buy volume from you. So right, right away, I'm thinking he's an undercover cop. So I go, all right, I got like an eight ball. Let's go down there. It was in North Bergen, so I knew it wouldn't make the papers. I wouldn't get arrested. She liked that. I knew I could maneuver myself out of there. It's North Bergen. The paperwork will disappear. The evidence will disappear. It's my hometown. I know friends. I have friends of the cops. Something will happen, you know. So I drive down there, and this kid kept saying tremendous. Where do you think I got the word tremendous from? It was that day. <laughs> That's where I got the word tremendous from. A Chinese restaurant in Mississauga, Canada. Every time. Called Tremendous. I'm like, where does this kid live? He, he was, he's in a hotel on, in Jersey City, on the border of North Bergen and Jersey City. And every time we'd do something, so the kid was in the back seat, I was in the front passenger seat, and the kid who was driving was not the type of kid you could play with. 
He didn't like what was about to happen. He mm-hmm. liked snorting coke, but this wasn't his world, and he had a short temper, if you know what I mean. He didn't take a lot of shit. So I would tell the kid, tell us where we're going. He's like, just go straight on Tunnel Avenue. And then he'd go, well, quick, 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 that left over there. And like my friend would fucking go, what the fuck is wrong with you? He'd make the left. And the guy in the back would go, that left was tremendous. <laughs> and then... <laughs> <laughs> couple miles later again da, 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 make a right over there my friend's like what the fuck is wrong with you i gotta cut off three people that right that was tremendous you know let me get a blast of the coke that cocaine is tremendous and finally my buddy goes say tremendous one more time i dare you i'm gonna beat the fuck out of you and we started laughing and henceforward because it's so annoying i say tremendous <laughs> <laughs> we went inside this seedy hotel room Black guy, Michael Jackson hair, way before the operation. Yeah, the Two Jerry Curl. skanky black white chicks. Skanky white chicks got beat up. They're runaways. Cigarette burns on their legs. I walk in there with my buddy and Steve, tremendous. And the guy's like, man, I did your coke and it all comes back. I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? He goes, I did your coke and it all comes back. And he showed me on a free base. He goes, nah, I don't do that punk ass snorting shit. I free base this motherfucker. And he would fucking take it, cook it, put it through a sock, a silk sock. He would take it off his foot and shit oh. and put it through the like the high part of it. And the rock would stay on the thing and develop, and then he would shave it and you'd smoke it. And I was hooked, dog. I'm like, what? Because that was the big white people shit. By 82, white people were already free basing. Wow. Minorities, we were still putting coke rocks in our nose. The people from, you know, ha, 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 those people yeah. were like, we don't do it. We don't want to hurt our noses. We'd rather put baking soda and smoke <laughs> it. So they were already off and running, white people. White people were already acting goofy. It's like they are with the, what's that shit they smoke now? Dabs. Yeah. They couldn't. Those are the same people. Same people that smoke dabs today are the same people that were free basing in the 80s. They couldn't just smoke reefer. They couldn't just snort coke. Oh, no. We got a free base. And these people, and then I went to this uh, head shop called In and Out. It's still there. In and Out? No, I forget what the way In and Out. That's a burger place. I went to a head shop that's still there, and they had a free bake kit, a free base kit. Can you believe that? I remember those head shops, and there was a lot it's of them in still Toronto. Still there, that head shop. It was a free base kit, and fifty bucks. I'm like, am I fucking? This is a half a gram of coke. I could either do this, and I remember we went to a friend's house. We brought like 13 grams of Coke in a bottle, and we fucking burned it all up. We smoked it. All I remember is waking up, and the, all the bottles were turned upside down. The pipe was there. There were bodies laying everywhere, and I was like, that's the end of my free basing career. It was too much drama. Get high. It's a lot I gotta of work. Wait. I got to wait for it to dry. I got to forget it. Just give it to me straight. Seems like more opportunities to get caught. Yeah. You're just hanging on to it for a long time. Yeah. It's just, it's just too much. It's all, all these accessories. It made Japan. I didn't like it. I didn't like that part. When you were in Toronto, you were exposed to all. Oh, yeah. You were in clubs. Yeah. I mean, I, I didn't do any of it, but I was around it. You miss Toronto? Yes. Of course. What time did the bars stay open to? Three, four. I had a good time in Toronto. Toronto was good. Toronto? Like, they stopped serving it too. But it's not like here where they fucking Nazi you out of your bottles at one thirty. At two two o'clock's when they stop serving. They let you keep your drinks out till three. Remember we used to go to Hollywood? What was that club up there? That that the magician ran? Oh, you played there? What was, what was the name of it? That was uh Toronto Wood. That was Boris's club. Boris. Yeah, what was the fucking club called? Comedy Wood. Comedy Wood. Comedy. I've told Lee about the story. Yeah, I, I did the weed, the weed club up there with Steve. Well, Steve didn't do the weed club. But That's the, downtown, that one, though. The woman who owns that, Puff Mama, it was a waitress, I think, at that club. Yeah. Because she remembered you guys. Yeah, I never played that club because I was a Yuck Yucks guy. Okay. If you were a Yuck Yucks guy, you weren't allowed you to work to anywhere that. else. Right. No, I remember one time going to Toronto and having a really, like, weird, good time. 
I can't, you were there for a, you had to go there. Where that club was, was in the middle of fucking nowhere. Yeah, but you had to go down there for two weeks. Yeah. He would hire you as a headliner for two weeks. Wow. And so you had two weeks in Toronto. You were off Sunday and Monday. You lived on top of the club. <laughs> you slept over the club in these little hallway rooms he had. And there was a shower. It was good enough for me in those days, you know? I yeah, on the, on the way up, and everything is fine. Everything is great. I would go downstairs. I'd have no complaints about anything. It'd be the worst fucking places you've ever stayed. You're like, ah, it's fine. But that was one week where they had movie theaters with waitresses. That was the one week where I lost my mind on Bloor Street at the strip club. Oh, like I really the one on Young Street. I what is it? York? It's Young and Bloor. It's like Young uh, and Bloor. Brass Rail. Yeah, Brass Rail. Those are strip clubs. Those oh, yeah. are old, old. Those are the strip clubs I grew up in. Anything yeah. goes. Shoot them, whatever you want to do. Oh, yeah. Just pay them. You know, I mean, I was really impressed. And I don't like strip clubs. I, since I don't know the fucking strip club. So my friend calls them wantstitutes. Oh, my God. Because they, they want a prostitute, but they can't commit to it. They were crazy. They were crazy. There was a place on there that sold scripts on Bloor Street that sold like old scripts. I still got Goodfellas signed. Wow. Yeah, they still had a bunch of shit. They, it was a great city. And I tell you what I met up there. I met a Cuban refugee that was one of Fidel's bodyguards. Really? And he, I met him at the club, and then he took me out the next day for lunch. He took me to a small Cuban neighborhood they have. Mm -hmm. It's like maybe two blocks long. He showed me some fucking interesting pictures, and he told me some wild stories about being Fidel's bodyguard. You're only in the rotation for three years, then you disappear. Oh, Jesus. And they never see you again. They tell you that he went to a different division. But you, years later, you'll talk to somebody and go, how's Lee doing? Lee who? Lee Syed. He went up to that work and we never seen Lee again. He was saying that Fidel was shooting his bodyguards because you knew too much information about uh -huh. him. So he felt he was next. So he shot to the United. He shot to Toronto. And that's where they took him in. And then... He tried to get shot up there, so the government protected him. He had a great story. He was telling me some fucking tremendous Fidel Castro <laughs> stories. <laughs> Walking into restaurants with Fidel, like Fidel would see a young woman that was attractive, whether she was married or not. One of his lieutenants would come up to you and say, excuse me, Mr. Peters, may I have a word with your wife? And your wife would get up and he'd go, Tomorrow morning, call this number. The comandante wants you to call the number. And you're a communist, so you call the number. And they would pick you up and take you to the doctor, give you a VD test, then ship you to Fidel's house to get fucked. Wow. They would check you out and everything. Well, they would make sure you're healthy, you had no cancer. They would give you a blood test and then take you right to Fidel's, <laughs> whether you were married or not. He had some great stories, bro. Fuck. I mean, if you're a dictator, that's the way to do it, I suppose. That's what it costs to me. That's what it means yeah. to be a fucking dictator. Yeah. Slinging dick and giving out fucking medical cards. <laughs> Slinging dick and eating taters. <laughs> what do you think, brother? What do you think of this whole thing? Talk to me. What thing? No work. How long do you think it'll last? Listen, I, mean, I, I, I went back to work. I, I, I didn't. I, I did my quarantine. I did at least two and a half months straight clean. What kind of work you got? So you're in West. Are you where this week? Miami, Miami coming up. Then after that, where you going? Uh, then I'm not working the week after because it's uh, Fourth of July, I think. Okay. And then I'm in. Uh, I got a whole run going now. That is crazy, Russell. After that, I'm in uh, uh, Stand Up Live in Phoenix. And then I'm in uh, the uh, Improv and Rally. Are you really going on? Yeah. Event? And then I'm in uh, Indianapolis at Helium. Then Virgi Virginia Beach Funny Bone. You flying private? St. To Louis these? Helium. You fly private to all these? Nah. Those days are over. Those days are over, buddy. Nashville's Zanies. Nashville is no direct flight. No, I know. Irvine. Yeah, I got it all. Portland coming up in September. Yeah, it's all it's all filling up there. Sacramento Punchline in October. I mean. I don't. I don't see many free weekends, to be honest with you. You're a fucking trooper, brother. I'm a road dog. What's you know? the inspiration? The fucking uh, baby's mama, or you really want to go on the road? I, you know, I, I love what I do. 
Hey, Listen, Ru- Russell, I love what I do, too. I just don't. You have a nice home life. I hear what you're saying. I need to get away. I hear you. I miss my kids when I'm away, you know, but. I mean, I mean, I, ultimately, I'm, I'm working for them. Right. Yeah, that's the same thing with me. Yeah. But you also got the luxury of having the podcast and it being a successful podcast. Yeah, but it's not all funny. It was me and Lee were talking about this before. It's been rolling with the punches lately. Lately. I mean, yeah. You know what I mean? was going on? Now they're all coming. And when nobody paid attention to the podcast because oh, there yeah. other things going on, now those other things aren't going on. Yeah, I remember doing Joe's in his house 10 years ago. Yeah. You know, you'd walk in the front door and you'd hang a right into that little ass room. I remember that. You know, you'd cut through the garage or something and. Yeah, you cut through the garage, and the room was on the right there. And then he moved it to uh, uh, Ice House. And then he moved it to that other place in Woodland Hills. Then he moved to the other place that he's in now. It's just crazy, the evolution of what happened with this shit. Nobody knew. No. Nobody knew. Nobody see it coming. And those are the biggest movements, like this movement now. With the, you never saw it fucking coming, this pandemic. Well, we never saw this podcast coming. Yeah, everybody was like, why don't you start a podcast? I go, and and I feel it's disrespectful for me to do it right now because it's like everybody's got one. I don't want to be just another fucking one in the, uh, in the fish tank. It's tough to start one right now. Yeah, it's, I know. So I'm like, it doesn't make sense to me. Oh, if you were to start this right now, people would look at you like it's a real down, it's a real uphill battle. You have a huge following, so... You got to hope that podcast listeners, you better hope that they will pay attention to you on that forum. You know, it's really weird. One time I had one of the biggest names of comedy on here, and it was the lowest numbers I ever had on a podcast. Really? That's how. That's how. You don't want to say? No. That's how awkward this is. That's how much I've learned. I've learned that. Yeah, it's really not who you have. It's it's what you're talking about. I, I, you know. Well, that they want the thing. information. That's one thing. I'm talking about when you look at uh, again this fucking read from my age. When you're looking at not even the guest or what you're talking about. I don't know what we're talking about, so it doesn't matter. I'm talking about how the podcast may or may not work. I, I just didn't know. When we started, when I started with Felicia, we were just talking about random shit. I was just trying to copy a radio show. That's it. And then one day I'm like, wait a second. This is what you hear on the radio. This is why people don't want to hear this. Yeah. People don't want to hear the voice. They want to hear you being real. People want to hear you being real. And I still remember telling them the story about mugging the hooker and like looking at her and her like this (laughs) and me going, I just struck a chord. This is what I need to talk about. And sure enough, this is when it all started. By Mm -hmm. me telling a story from Bert, it was telling the machine story on Rogan. It just ran like a fucking, you know. Yeah, I remember doing Bert's podcast maybe six years ago. Yeah. He came to my house and we did it. It was just, it's basically an interview. That's it. And that's why I don't like doing some guy's podcast. He's like, so why don't you tell everybody how you got started? I, you're a comic. Don't ask me that. You no, fucking know no. these questions. Those are the worst things you can ask us to do. I've always tried to go against the grain. I've always, even with a podcast. You're not a conformist, so we don't have to worry. I don't want to hear, listen, if I go on the news and everybody's talking about something, then that's the last thing I want to talk about. But this is the problem I, I do see. A lot of people want your specific take on it. Yeah. They want your take on the situation. Yeah, what do you think about blah, blah? What do you think about blah, blah, blah? I don't think nothing about blah, blah, blah. I'm dead and buried. What do I think about blah, yeah. blah, blah? I'm in worse shape than you are. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. What do I think about blah, blah, blah? So I can't. Uh, I just wanted to. When I did this podcast, I wanted to let people know that we've been getting lied to. That they lied to you. Your guidance counselor lied to you. Oh, yeah. People lied to you. You don't need to do this. This is what you need to do. I never went to college. And if I'm a felon and I could do it Mm -hmm. and they told you you can't do nothing, like they pretty much tell you in prison, once you get out of here, you're dead. You'll never be able to get a job. People won't hire you because you're a felon. In fact, you should sign up for disability now. Mm -hmm. 
That's what they tell you. Sign up for disability now. Because My buddy got out. He signed up for disability. Yeah. But he did 33 years. So. Yeah. And what's he going to do now? With now life? he's dead. Did he really die? He died during this thing. Really? He died. He, he hadn't even been out four years that he died three and a half years out. He 33 died. years for what? Uh, bodies. Bodies. He had a few bodies. 14 in the hole. No shit. 14 in the hole. I, I got his light. I got light, the rights to his life story. How'd they catch him? Um, he was in, they did a robbery or something and he was in a car, in the getaway car. And the guy, you know, fucking, they ran over somebody crossing the street and they, you know, it was, it was a big mess. Man. I tell you, that's one place I look at now. And I don't want to be in there. He was in every Supermax prison on the East East Coast. Every. They would move him all the time. You're causing problems here. You need to go. Oh, the, was he a problem causer too? He was like a shot caller, so they'd move him. He was like, you can move me wherever the fuck you want. I know. I, I got my people everywhere. That's crazy. 33 fucking years. 33. He died 10 days before his 63rd birthday. And I was the second person on the call sheet from the hospital. How did you become friends with him? I met him about maybe two weeks after he got out. He was friends with a friend of mine <clears throat> who uh, a friend uh, a, f- a friend of mine who who stayed in touch with him and looked out for him the entire time he was in jail, whereas everybody fucked off on him. So when he came out, we were in New York, and <clears throat> I'm just talking to him. You know, I just see Puerto Rican guy as far as I knew. You know, was talking, hanging out. And then we're talking. He tells me he just got out. I'm like, what? I go, I said to my friend, I go, yo, he just got out. He goes, yeah. How long did he do? 33, 33, are you, are you fucking kidding me? And at the time I was doing real well too. So, I mean, I took him to Macy's. I bought him a whole new wardrobe. So he, he need to look right. And then there was a Gucci in there. I bought him Gucci shoes, Gucci belt, Gucci jacket. Bought him a new phone, iPad, all that shit. Just set him up right. This guy loved me after that, you know. So you went. But his first, his first, his first murder was, um, his first murder was when he was eleven. Jesus Christ! Killed these twins in his projects who were bullying everybody. He was eleven, and uh, these twins were about seventeen. And he goes down to play with one of his friends, and his friend looked all fucked up because what happened here? He goes, those fucking twins! They robbed me and they beat me up because they can't do that. My brother's got a gun. And he goes up and gets his brother's gun. And he finds one. And he goes, pop, pop, pop. Shoots him. And then he goes to the corner where the other one is. Yo, something happened to your brother. He comes over. Pop, pop. Shoots that one too. Goes into juvie psych for uh, for four years. Comes out like 14, 15. Just running the streets then. Yeah, when you kill somebody at 11. Yeah. There ain't no coming. And his brothers were like in the in that life, you know, but it but it's weird because his uh his family wasn't like a broken family. They weren't they were the only family in the his in his project building that were not on uh, welfare. Cuz his dad owned a bunch of bodegas and uh some meat shops, some butchers and uh you know that kind of shit, butcher shops and some some bodegas and everybody loved his family because his dad would tell you when you came into the store. He goes, "Listen, you don't fucking steal from me. You don't rob from me. You don't rob me. If you need something and you don't got the money, you come and tell me and you write me an IOU and you pay me whenever you can. And everybody loved his family for that. So he was really revered in the hood. Fort Greene, you know? Yeah. Yeah, it's really tight. Yeah. I just, when you say the number 33, it just crinkles my asshole. Oh. I don't think a Larry Bird. I think a 33 hard, long years. Oh, dude, 14 in the hole. Really, it was 12. He it got started sentenced. with 12. It started right. with 12. It usually does. Because uh, he killed a guy in the yard Um, for this, this fucking guy. He just he killed him, whatever. And just, but long story short, he killed a guy in the yard. He got put in for 12. While he was in the hole, you know, you can talk to each other through the walls. There was a guy in the in the cell next to him. You don't see each other. You just hear the voice. The guy's talking shit to him for about three years. 
<laughs> Three years this guy's talking shit. Fuck you. You're a punk. You're a pussy. I'll fucking kill you. You ain't shit. I know who you are, you fucking pussy. And and my guy's like, all right, you watch. I'm going to find you. He gets out of the hole after 12 years. His hair's long. Beard's long. He go. Everyone's like, yo, welcome back, man. Yo, I need to go to the barbershop. Goes to the barbershop. Starts leaning back. And, it, and there's a guy in the chair beside him. His eyes are closed. He's just getting his shit done. Here's the guy talking in the chair beside him. That was the guy. He got up and fucking stabbed him. And went right back in the hole for two more years. Oh, at least he made a statement. <laughs> hey, he wasn't the guy you were going to... No. There's guys that make, you know... And he's a little guy. He wasn't like a big guy, and he wasn't like a diesel guy. He was like a guy, like... I don't know. I think I easily could take the guy. But nope. He had a fucking streak in him. No, he had something we don't have. You know what I mean? The ability to do something we would never have to... I will never be able to do. Just listen. There's murder, and then there's doing 33 fucking years. Oh, yeah. And doing 12 in the hole, I mean. 14. You know, it, I was talking to Tink Rogan on the phone, and we were talking about this whole thing in Milwaukee, or Mi- Minneapolis. Minneapolis. And how that guy, they have to be watching him. They have to, but his, his he knows it. He knows that his end is going to be a violent, very violent one. It's not going to be a fun end, because if he gets convicted of whatever murder yeah they'll put him in uh where they put the rats you know when people rat out the protective custody but guess what they'll kill you in protective custody protective custody means oh yeah you, you he sees a, nothing what's that shit that oj's wife had a restraining order yeah. <laughs> more people have died with restraining orders than die with oh my friend told order. me he was like yeah you can go yeah. to pc we got guys PC, on it. you're done yeah, they got it's guys. Just a matter of time, they got guys on their team. On their team that will request PC just to go just in and to kill go you. in there and kill you. There's tons of stories of people who have done you wrongly and have gone to prison, and we could get them once they're in prison. We know where they are, and there's somebody who's got 80 years, and their wife needs two thousand to pay the mortgage. Oh yeah, and there's, they'll it's, slice them up into pieces. For there's, you. it's fucking you easy. You go to give get the wife twenty five hundred to pay her mortgage, and watch, watch it on the news. They take his ears, they take everything, his eyeballs. They, by the time the cops get there, there's nothing left to donate. Yeah, he, there's he, nothing left to donate. They take his nose. <laughs> you know, that's the ease. That's why when you see all these people getting in trouble and they get these cops that get convicted or whatever, they did wrong. But when they go in, that guy is number one on the poster. Public Enemy is going to buy the song about the cop that killed George Floyd. So what? What name me one prison where there's not one one black prison guard, right? And there's going to be three good white cops, and they're going to go. Guess who's here? Oh yeah, he disgraced cops. So he knows. He might as well hang himself now, like to make it. Yeah, easy. he's not going to make it. He's, he's gonna not going to make it. He might as well kill himself. He's going to kill himself before He's trial. avoiding getting raped, stabbed. He's and he had a real raped. rat face on him. Yeah, they're going to rape him. They're going to do a bunch of things to him. He might as well tell his family just to kill him on visitation. And his like, wife left him right after it happened. Yeah, he's the kiss of death. That's why they got him on suicide watch. But those guys do not last. I don't care how PC. They go away. They're sending, remember, when you have a 120-year sentence, you ain't going nowhere. Yeah. And they've already exhausted your appeal, and you appeal three times, you're not going nowhere. But guess what? You got a wife and two kids at home, and they need money. So it's quick. It's like a quick deal. It's like code over the phone. They write, you write a letter to him. He burns it, and he's on a mission from Satan. You get the money is. And usually you give the money when the job is done. I'll bring it to your wife right now just to give you a little bit more incentive to let you know the guy you're dealing with. And it's over. I know when I did time, I heard some horrific stories and how guys were making a living inside. and Inside contracts, they happen all the time. Yeah, inside's like a fucking Inside's a business. nightmare. That's a complete different business. But a panic attack. Jesus. That's why you don't, that's why nobody does nothing. You don't worry about nothing. He's going to go to jail and we get him. 
He's going to go to Pelican Bay, and we're going to make a call. Wherever he goes. Wherever he goes, we're going to make a call. They'll set him I, on I got fire a friend that's got a friend that's got a friend. PC, and, they'll just set you on fire in your cell. Yeah. It's a very scary. I did a couple fucking months, and, you know, I felt comfortable after a while. But I knew where I was. You don't turn the lights off. You never turn the lights off. You know where you are. And you know anything can bounce off at any fucking time. It's that quick. You're dealing with 90 people who have fucking tempers. Ten of them are nice people who did bad things. But there's 80 killers who, they got nothing to lose. They don't care. By the time you get to some levels, like when I went to Ordway for a couple nights and before I went to Camp George West, that's that's there's a prison in Colorado they call Gladiator Heaven. That's where they send all the steroid people. That are 21 to 26 that want to fight themselves to death. That's what they send you. They call 18 to 25. They call those places Gladiator Heaven. You won't make it. You won't make it. Those are for young kids. And then you move on. And once you get older, you're peaceful. But there's always one motherfucker that thinks he's cute. And you have to establish yourself. That's good that you took care of him, bro. I appreciate you. You've been good Man, to a that lot was of my comedians. Dude. And a lot of people, I'm sorry, he passed on you and shit. That's one thing you have good. You have great karma, bro. You helped a lot of people. A lot of my friends say you help them all the time. And that means that's why I check in on you. You know, you got to look at I'm the same as you. We, we look out for people. We're, I look out for people. We're empathetic you. guys. And we've seen some shit in our lives, so we understand how bad it can get. You understand? I understand the plight. I understand. I've been there. Yeah. I've covered every emotion that people who listen to this show covered. I've had a loss. I've been addicted. I've been homeless. I, I, you know, I've struggled. You know, I've been there. You know, it's every situation. You want to know? I've been heartbroken. I've had a kid taken from me. I lost a kid on purpose because I, w- I was a junkie. I mean, tell me. I've been through all the emotions you go through. Yeah. And this is what I've always stressed with it's that. Just because you guys think we're living out here, we put our pants on one leg at a time. Mm-hmm. Just like regular people. We've all had fucking crazy past, you know? I tell Lee all the time, go out there, have a story, go get VD, do something, go get crabs. You just can't sit in your house. You're 31. You don't want to die not having something. That's what it's all about is meeting the chick who says to you, let's go to my friend's house. And you're like, okay. And all of a sudden it's an orgy. And there's a white chick getting fucked by eight black guys in the ass, and they're all coming on the face, and you're sitting there like, "Hi," and and, <laughs> and you're you uncomfortable. I said Boston. Oh, that's right. You and you're uncomfortable. Part. You have to go somewhere where you become uncomfortable to really go home and go, "Wow, I never want to do that again." Like it's it's just being uncomfortable at places. Yeah, you need you need to see the bad in order to appreciate the good. I guess I. I don't mind seeing the bad. I don't really want to go to. You don't have to be a part of the bad. Yeah, the the manslaughter and doing doing but, crap. You know, there's levels. More. You don't have to go to that level. Yeah. You're you're not the guy that they're going to be letting in anyway. No, thank God. <laughs> That's I'm fine with that. So you got all these weeks going on, brother. I'm fucking Back happy on the for road, you. just working. I'm happy for you. Bro. You know, I had written an entirely new act before this whole shit happened. Did you? And I was like ready. I was it was ready, and I was on the road working it, and I was like, all right. I'm polish- I was in the polishing stage, you know, and it was about to all start in June. And then, uh, then this shit happened, and then I forgot it all because I don't write it down. Then I got on stage Thursday last week. Where'd you go on stage last week? Uh, American Comedy Club. You went all the way down. There? I did seven shows. Seven shows. Mm-hmm. First night, couldn't remember my name. Second night, all it all came back. How did you feel on stage after the first, after night? The first night? I felt I was. I, to be honest with you, ten minutes in, I wanted to get the fuck off stage. Why? I still was uncomfortable. I was like, I can't remember anything. I don't even know why I'm doing this. Sold was, out. My head wasn't in it. Yeah, they're all sold out, but I mean, it's a hundred capacity. You know what I mean? So, but now it's it's all good now. And what nights did you do? Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. One Thursday, two Friday, two Saturday, two Sunday. Yeah, I need to start with one, just one show. I think the first show is going to be enough for Uncle Joey. The first show, yeah, you're, you're going to feel it the first show. but I won't? You will. First show, you'll be like, oh, fuck. It's, there's little things you may re- you forget. 
and then uh, like what i don't know like little details about something i mean oh your act okay. yeah 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 i don't have an act now yeah there's no act that's why part of me is happy that they canceled break yeah give you a break give you a break because no i'm going back to do uh residential whatever the fuck oh that. yeah once a month twice a month in brea and once in oxnard because i'll tell you afterward it's just a lot better for me mm -hmm. it'll give you an hour to work like i have an hour to work instead of pieces of 15 minutes right and i think at this stage right now what i'm looking to do that's the best thing i could do yeah i'm looking to go out next year once the soprano movie comes out the is it done it's done, but they put had to push everything back. You're in it? No, my friend's in it. Yeah, I'm fucking in it. The prequel. Unless they fucking come Is Mike me out. in it? Is that why they were on uh, Joe's thing? Mike, Mike and uh, Steve? No, 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 no. They're doing a really good podcast called The Soprano Podcast. I know. I don't know the name of it. It's something. And you know, Michael had the, uh, he wrote the script or right. the screenplay to Omerta, and he never made it. This was like 20. No, not even twenty. It was like maybe seventeen, eighteen years ago. He told me this. He had he was working on that. Michael Perriello. Yeah, yeah. yeah he's I did a good a, writer. He's a great guy, though. Is he great? He lives up he, up here, close to you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, is he by me? Santa I lost Barbara. touch with him. I lost touch with him. But yeah, we used to hang out when he was shooting. We did a movie together in Toronto years ago. When they were hanging, real out. actor too. He's a real, he's a real fucking real. He's a serious fucking. Yeah, he's actor. a good actor. Jesus, you could see him on Rogan. He was a little like. He was out of his realm. He's an yeah. introverted guy. Well, Sharippa used to be the booker for the Riviera, yeah. right? So. Very, uh, very uh, reserved. He's he's great at what he does. He directed a few episodes of Sopranos. He wrote a few episodes of The Sopranos. So he really has it together. He's a together young kid. You gotta. He's not just Spider who got shot. In the nah. fucking Spider, movie. Spider, you fucking bullshit of you. You fucking bullshit of you. Hey, we were at a bar in Toronto and like, it must have been 2002, and uh, we're having some drinks, and this Indian dude comes up, and he's like, oh, shit, Russell Peters. He goes, oh, man. He points at Michael, and he's like, that's amazing. Yo, do all you in, do all the Indian actors and comedians know each other? And I'm like, huh? And, and he goes to Michael, what part of India are you from? <laughs> and Michael goes, Calcutta. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hilarious! No, he was good. Yeah, that was a good podcast. They did. listen to Sopranos. Man, is a great show that not a lot of people watch. Did you hear what they were saying that it's number two on HBO behind Westward right now? Yeah, and it hasn't been on the air for thirteen years. I don't know how long. You know, The Wire was apparently like a flop for the first three years, but it's the fun, one of the you best shows ever made. I'm thinking about putting it on again. Oh, oh that's a great I, I love the one. How many seasons was it? Four, on? Four. I think. No, it was more than that. I think it was six. Really? Wow. There's two shows I'm dying to put back on again. The Wire and the Prison One from HBO. Oz. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oz. I heard that one's intense. I haven't seen that yet. I had Oz. I, I used to know, love Oz too. I used, I used to, say, to love Oz. I used to say Oz was like sex in the city for guys. Yeah. <laughs> Oz is Oz was good. I don't know. And I just about eh, about a month ago I go. And power I like. Power. I like That's power. the guy that went to. That was Fifty Cent show. Oh no, I never watched. It that. was on Stars. That was a fucking. I loved it a lot. I loved it. And that they show. say that Harlem show was good. The King of yeah, Harlem. Yeah, I gotta watch that. That's the one with Forrest Whitaker. Is it Forrest Whitaker? The other so. black dude? No, the other black. Godfather dude. of Harlem. The Godfather of Harlem. It's the other black. It's dude. not Forrest Whitaker. No, it's the guy from Eight Eight Mile. The big black guy from Eight Mile. That's big. He is also on. Oh, you're talking Entourage about Omar for, Benson Miller? Entourage for football. What's Entourage oh, yeah, oh, Omar, for football? Yeah, the ballers. Ballers. He's yeah, Omar that. Benson he plays, Miller. He plays the Miami Dolphins guy. Yeah, yeah, no, I think it's... Uh, yeah, I think that's who it is. No, 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 it's, sure. it's uh, Forrest Whitaker, and it's funny because everybody thinks Omar is Forrest Whitaker's kid. <laughs> yeah, that's fucking crazy. I can't see without my glasses. I'm gonna have to I've seen the fucking billboard, and that's all I know. Uh, what's it called? Godfather Harlem. Huh? God damn it, this fucking suntan. It's still lens. burning you? Bro, I rip off. My wife says she's been sweeping my skin for the last four days. Ooh. Yeah, it hurts. Doesn't hurt anymore. It stopped hurting after five days. It's just the burn was so fucking deep. I burned two Yeah, it's Forrest Whitaker. Forrest Whitaker. I heard that's a great show, too. Yeah, I'm going to see that. I next. can't believe you love all that stuff. I love you for that. You love music. 
You're yeah. still spinning at night? Still spin when I got time. Downstairs, the kids yeah, dance in, while in you the, spin? Uh, oh, no, no. My house, it's in a whole other wing. You won't even hear it. Really? Yeah. So the spinning is somewhere else? It's in the man cave, so. But you ever play for your kids, I mean? My kid, well, the problem is when the kids see it, they're like, they want to go, I, I want to DJ, and then they want to just hit buttons and not, and it bothers me. I'm like, listen, <laughs> you respect the art, or I don't, I don't fucking push the buttons. You scratch and stuff? Yeah, yeah, I used to babble. No shit. Yeah. Russell, you're an interesting motherfucker, man. It never ends with you. You, Joseph, how dare you? Every week is a new fucking adventure. Uh, fuck so Miami is ready for you. You should have not got to close that city by the time you get. You know, I hope not. I, I, I am looking forward to it. You know. And you, you trust everything. The I flight. had a chick do blow off my dick there once. Did you in <laughs> Miami? Yeah. If somebody's going to do blow off your dick, it's going to be Miami. Oh yeah. It was a small. That's where they do the bump. weirdest fucking things in the world. <laughs> I had a chick who told me in Miami one night if I could do a headstand, I could fuck her. And you should have seen me try to do a headstand, coked up. I tried like two times. She got up and left. No. <laughs> you think I'm fucking kidding you? So it's anything is possible in Miami. Kill him next week. Thanks, I love Joe. you to death. What's your website? Anything? RussellPeters.com. At Russell, at Russell Peters on Instagram. You got a full schedule in North Carolina, Raleigh, Raleigh Indianapolis, Raleigh. Helium. You're going everywhere. I'm Cox going. Center. I just got to go, man. Well, I wish you luck. I thank you for coming on the show on a Monday Thanks morning. Thanks for having me. You know, we've been talking about it for months, actually. Yeah, man. You we were, were going to Zoom man. it. We were going to face mask it. i like, Joey, I don't give a fuck. Let's just do it in fucking person. Do it. The door's open. I want to see you. I want to see the you. The door is open. I got fucking Lysol, Clorox. I spray some of him. Everybody gets a fucking hit for Lysol. Just so they take that bugs back home with them. I love you, motherfuckers. Hold on one second. Let me read some ads to you. We're back like COVID. No big fucking deal. <laughs> you didn't know COVID was making a comeback. Get it together. A bunch of fucking mooks walking around, jumping up and down, hugging each other. What do you expect? Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the Russell Peters fucking little interview. I love Russell. He's a good man. Solid. Uh, we did a nighttime one just to, you know, we're comics, man. And uh, I came to the solution that we were going to, we, we used to do this show at night. And all of a sudden we became pussies. <laughs> and we started doing it at nine in the morning like little fucking pussies that we are. And uh, we got to go back to nights because we got to fill our nights. We just sit there and every time Jeopardy comes on, I want to put a fucking knife in my throat. <laughs> so uh, thank you, Russell, again for coming. Listen, I got some dates for you protesters who want to come out with sticks and shit. Come on down. The more you that come down, the more fucking tickets I sell. So keep it up, cocksuckers. Anyway, I got July 30th through August 1st at the Brea Improv. We should be open. I know a lot of you guys bought tickets. You know, I never wanted to fuck none of you guys and fucking uh, whatever. So we're coming. Plus, on top of that, I'm going to be doing a house residency there uh, two Tuesdays a month and one Wednesday a month, at, uh, one Tuesday a month up in Oxnard. I'll keep you guys posted. Again, thank you very much for having me. It's Wednesday, the 24th. My anniversary is next weekend. I appreciate all the support and love you gave me 20 years with the same woman. I couldn't fucking stay with the same woman for 20 minutes. She got out of my face once I hit her with a shot of bad breath. But listen, this one stuck around. We're here. We're queer. You know what I'm saying? I want to shout out everybody who had my back. I love you motherfuckers to death. Uh, if you're not fucking loyal and you don't have no friends, you have nothing in life. You guys proved that last week. So I love you to death. Thank you for having my back. I want to thank the Christ killer for helping me out and being a soldier of death. And listen, we're going to keep telling stories, okay? Nothing's going to fucking change. Next week, I'm going to tell you about when I poked the guy in the eye and he, we had a fucking, he walked around with a bandage for three weeks and he couldn't go to the cops. I'll tell you that one. That's a good one. Have a great weekend. God bless you. Stay black. Oh, I got a little surprise for you tomorrow, Thursday. Uh, you'll hear about it Friday, all right? So you guys know something's coming. I'm just giving you a heads up because I love you. I can't say what it is, but you motherfuckers know what it is already. Don't forget, look on your computer Friday morning. Stay black. Have a great week. I love you motherfuckers. Kick this mule, Lee.